6.20 in Trinidad and Tobago. Very good of you to be with us on this Tuesday morning. So confirmation, Dylan Carter uh, finishing third in his heat in the men's 100-meter freestyle in the swimming pool at the Tokyo Olympic Games. Andrew Lewis finishing 30th in race number five of the laser class in sailing. I'll check the results on, laser, on race number six uh, in a little while that uh, was held uh, earlier today. The, the wind conditions really excellent uh, in Tokyo right now because of a coming storm. And because of that, they actually brought forward uh, the, the surfing, the first time surfing is being held at an Olympic Games and the medals were awarded earlier today. All right, let's deal with something that we have to deal with, uh, traumatic experiences, because whenever we want to address the topic of trauma, we invite our next guest to share his perspective. If you look at the front pages today, we just touch, touched on it. Uh, it's littered uh, with traumatic experiences, uh, uh, the Maraval family, uh, and indeed a tragedy that has resonated with many citizens. Over the weekend, uh, the conclusion of the Sean Luke trial and uh, the reminding of our, ourselves of uh, what happened to that little boy some 16 years ago, uh, again, uh, caused so much angst uh, for many people who would have had to relive that situation, not least uh, his mother, Pauline Lumfai. And of course, uh, today marks the 31st anniversary of uh, the coup attempt by the Jamaat al muslimin an event that claimed a number of lives that uh, it appears, certainly when it comes to public individuals, only the President of the Republic is interested. But uh, even after a commission of inquiry, it has left more questions than answers. Well, you would think that no society can just sweep these matters under the carpet or under the rug, regardless of how hard they try. If we fail to deal with it directly, we'll have to pay the price uh, for the indirect consequences of that inaction. Well, how do we cope with these traumatic memories and indeed these real life situations as recent as yesterday? Well, Hanif Benjamin, President and Chief Executive Officer and Clinical Therapist and Clinical Traumatologist at the Center for Human Development. He joins us now, former Chairman of the Children's Authority as well. Uh, Mr. Benjamin, it, it, it seems that I have to say good morning to you, but it's never for a good reason that we want to talk to you. Good morning to you anyway. Good morning, Faris. It always seems as if we speak under these difficult circumstances, no less today, uh, with so many trauma that surrounds us. When you when you really look at Trinidad and Tobago today, for you are seeing what is called complex trauma. And, and of course, I would have spoken about the red onion effect, layer upon layer upon layer of trauma. So we are dealing with the 31st anniversary of the 1990, which continues to be a major factor in the lives of so many. We are talking about the most tragic of incident yesterday, no less than 24 hours ago. We've lost the lives of three young ones and a family now reeling, so, so, so difficult. And we're also talking about trauma coming back to the surface in, in such a real way in the Sean Luke matter. So, so it is a difficult day today for zero. And, and how do we cope? In, in fact, some people might be saying, you know, I'm going to switch the channel right now because I really don't want to hear all of this. That I'd rather maybe watch some Olympic Games coverage or watch some, something else, something happy and, and smiley because I really can't take any more of this negativity uh, because it weighs me down. I have to go to work. In fact, I don't have to go to work. I don't have a job right now. I can't feed my family. I can't find money. To, to, to pay the bills and so on. Why do I want to hear Hanif Benjamin and Fazir Mohammed going on and on and on about these very negative things? And, and it's for the simple reason, Fazir. We, we don't deal with things. We don't deal with our trauma. We have children who are traumatized, who are adults today, and who are living in a trauma environment mentally, and we have created a trauma physical environment. So whether we want to deal with it in a frontward way or deal with it uh, from the back. Either way, trauma will deal with us because trauma have a way of manifesting itself over our life in, 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 in various ways and in sometimes ways that we really don't want for it to come out. And so whether you turn on the TV today or tomorrow, we continue to live in the trauma. Like in 1990, we have not dealt with the trauma of that in any real way. We have not dealt with the ensuing generational trauma that would have been created because of 1990. We have not processed in any real way the mental health challenges that happened then and continues to happen now. You see, for you, when these things happen without dealing with it in a, in a frontward and professional manner, 
what we are doing is continuing to live in the traumatic incident. We have not moved from the traumatic incident to the traumatic recovery. And so what we've done is design coping mechanism around the traumatic incident. So we live our life through a trauma lens. You remember trauma is an emotional response. That is what trauma is, an emotional response. And so our emotion may have been skewed to deal with the trauma, not in a, in a positive way, because now we are trying to cope because we are not dealing with it from a frontal place. And 31 years later, we have the lone president and that other gentleman who comes out every year. And there is never any real closure for so many people. And as you rightly say, a commission of inquiry did not bring closure. As a matter of fact, it brought more questions that we still have not been answered today. And so when you live in that trauma-filled place, you become hyper-vigilant. You become jumpy in Trinidad terms. You live from that perspective. And for you, the sad thing is, it has been transferred from generation to generation to generation. And, and, and therefore, you know, again, we don't want to just go over the same ground that we've gone over many times because even, even though it might be important to reinforce it, Hanif Benjamin, and by the way, the person you were, you were referencing is Wendell Eversley, of course, and he, he would have been mm -hmm. the, the, the one who, who reminds everybody about the, about the event. Uh, and, and as you said correctly, with the exception of the president, no one else does so in any, in, in any formal way. But some will say, well, you know, I disagree with you, Hanif Benjamin. I've moved past that, you know. Okay, you know, it hasn't properly resolved. We never really had proper closure and understanding of what happened. But life goes on. I can't live in the past from 1990. Uh, uh, whatever issues that, that would have transpired from them, we've moved past that. The, the nation has moved past that, Hanif Benjamin. And, and I, I would say, you know, if that is the construct that you would like to create um, so that you could feel as if you are living a normal life, fine. But there's absolutely nothing normal about untreated trauma. And as much as people want to tell me that they may have moved on, I say to people all the time, you come into my office, yeah, I deal with that now. I put that behind me, but five minutes into the session, you're crying. Why is that? Because trauma reminders are real. You see, because we have developed coping mechanism, in most instances, negative coping mechanism. It doesn't mean that we have dealt with it. The fact that you have not been able to, to meet your family face to face, the fact that you have been dealing with different uh, uh, um, trauma reminders ever so often, when you hear certain things, it has some people still the sound of explosion um, doing things to them or noise in general. There are people who have become reclusive. There are people who are living in a depressed state. There are people who would have lost their businesses and have never recovered in any significant way. So when you tell me that you have moved past, I always have the question, what is moving past to you? Because you see, for you, once you have created a trauma lens, that is how you see your life. And unfortunately, for a lot of people who have been traumatized, you think that you are living a normal life. But when you really take stock of the different domain of your life, your spirituality, your physical life, your, your, your mental life, your friends, your social life, all of these things start painting a very, very different picture in relation to, to what is going on in your life. So that is not entirely true that you have moved past. What you would have done is you would have created a, a, a road in which you could traverse, which might in your instant be less traumatic. But it doesn't mean that the trajectory of your life has been changed forever. It doesn't mean that your physical life has been changed forever. It doesn't mean that your mental life has changed forever. I tell you one thing again, the example of how you went through that trauma and how you are now perpetrating that response to your children to your grandchildren. Those are real things that we don't see every day. But when you sit and you analyze it from a professional perspective, you really realize that, way. I really did not deal with the things that I ought to have dealt with back then.
And, and, and therefore, you know, and, and I know you've, you've re referred to, to us as a hurting nation in, in many ways, and, and m many others, uh, whether psychiatrists, psychologists, and so on, those that in, engage in the, in, the, in, the, in the study of human behavior would have talked about us being a hurting nation. Uh, but again, Mr. Benjamin, and, 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 and we're going to take a break in a short while, and then we'll come back, and you'll probably give us some, some prescriptives as to how we should really be dealing with this situation in, in, a, in, a, in a much more productive way, or progressive sort of way. But at the end of the day, Mr. Benjamin, many may hold the view that, look, it's not about sweeping it under the carpet so much as saying that, look, prioritizing, you know, why I, I really don't have the time or the emotional energy to properly process what happened yesterday. I don't want to. I don't want to think about it because when I think about a child in a burning house screaming for their life, losing their life, I might think of my own grandson. When I think about Sean Luke and I see the images in the papers and understanding what he went through, I see my own grandson. When I think about July 27, 1990, I might say, look, the, the, the country doesn't, you know, the, the authorities don't seem to be keen on it. So, so why should I drag myself through, through that uh, emotional, those emotional calls, for, for want of a better term, uh, having to put myself through that just for the sake of emotional survival, lock it off. That might be the best way to deal with it. Because you, there is no locking off. And that's the challenge there. We, we think that we are locking it off, but there is no locking off when, you, when it comes to trauma. And one way or the other, our body, our mind, it keeps the score. And Van de Kuyk spoke about it in his book, The Body Keeps the Score. Our body keeps the emotional wounds. Our body keeps the physical wounds. Our body keeps the psychological wounds. And so whether or not you believe that you have locked it off, you have not locked it off. We have a lot of angry people. We have a lot of family who are perpetrating violence against children because of what they would have gone through. We have a lot of failed marriages and relationships because of what they would have gone through in the past. We have a lot of people who have not reached their truest potential because of what they are dealing with and what they would have gone through. So there is no real locking off. Trauma finds a way to manifest itself sometimes in ways that we do not want to, to, to really bring out there. Our emotional response, our physical response, our physiological response. When you talk about the ASA, the adverse child effect, when you look at that study for you, where you are seeing the link between childhood and adolescent trauma and physical ailments, you're talking about lifestyle diseases, heart attacks, stroke, diabetes, all of those things. So when we really say we lock it off, what we really mean, we have a lot of hurt adults walking around in, 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 in a child's mind. So we have a lot of children walking around as adults today, wounded from rape, abuse, and maltreatment, all manner of trauma. And because we are not processing it, and we think that we're good to go, we are walking around abusing our children further. We are walking around abusing our staff. We are walking around abusing society because we have not dealt with our own dark demons and we are living those demons every day, not knowing that those demons are the ones that are walking in front of us and leading us. So in any real sense, if you want to enjoy a better quality of life, I'm not saying you're going to be a millionaire, but I'm saying if you want to enjoy a better quality of life, you have to begin to deal with that dark place that is leading you today because many of us are not being led by the light or clarity. We are being led by the trauma that has been an albatross around our neck for many, 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 many years. And just as a final thought, before we take that, that break, um, have you seen any progress? I mean, we've been having this discussion, and I know you would have had this discussion on many other media uh, over the years. But within, the, let's say, within the last decade or within your your time of professional experience, are you seeing any movement in the right direction? At least a willingness to be a little more honest and open as a society in in really appreciating the need to address these issues. Yes, I, I, I must say. Um, I have seen what I would call leaps 
in, 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 in a real sense in terms of mental health. And I think COVID-19 has just thrust it before us in, um, in even a more real way. I have seen where from the governmental coming all down to the man on the street, their understanding, their belief, their, their, their willingness to move forward. I have seen more and more discussion about mental health. I see more people are coming forward for mental health treatment. I see the professionals are speaking about it. The mere fact that you and I have been talking about this on a regular basis and on other media. So we see the countries moving forward. But I think we need to move forward a little further faster and the way in which we can do that for you is by making mental health treatment on the same level as physical health treatment i keep making the representation that every health center should be staffed with social workers and psychologists psychiatrists it should be readily available for all and sundry not everybody could pay to come to see a private professional we need to make it sustainable we need to remove the backlog from our um, child guide clinic and from mental health clinic so that people can have real time and very importantly for you we need to change the policy or practice in our emergency rooms when it comes to mental health because nobody would could come with a psychotic break and sit in a waiting room for four or five hours to be seen you need to be seen as an emergency so those are the, the policy movement and that is why I continue to do what I do at the Center for Human Development to push policy forward to change legislation so that we could put mental health on par with physical health nobody should have to look to see where to get mental health treatment just like you go to your podiatrist your, your whatever trist, you should be able to go to your psychiatrist or your psychologist or your clinician just like that and when we get there for you we would have achieved a great milestone We'll talk about that uh, even further when we come back at 6.36 in Trinidad and Tobago. We'll resume our dialogue with Hanif Benjamin in a moment. But it's now time to remind you of the COVID-19 protocols. Wear a mask over the nose and mouth when you go out in public. Keep your distance from others at least six feet. Stay home if you're ill. Wash your hands often with soap and water or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Cough into a tissue or into the crook of your elbow. Avoid touching your face. Sanitize hard surfaces, tabletops, handrails, doorknobs and trolleys or even cell phones as well as often as possible. We'll resume our dialogue right after this break. Six thirty nine in Trinidad and Tobago. Continuing our dialogue with Hanif Benjamin, Chief Executive Officer, Clinical Therapist, Clinical Traumatologist at the Center for Human Development. So, Mr. Benjamin, uh, again, at the risk of going over the same beaten ground, because I know you would have given a number of prescriptives uh, over the months and years that we've been having this dialogue. What what do we do? What do we do in trying to 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 be to to be less traumatized than we are, or at least trying to resolve the, the, the many issues that may be lingering in our minds. I, I think, um, and, and it's so strange, I don't know what twisted fate that we would be starting our three-day training today in partnership with Bryn Mawr College School of uh, Social Work in Philadelphia. And the focus of this training um, is to deal with the organization on a level. I think that while some of us are trauma-informed, trauma-expert, I think too many of us, too many of our institutions are not trauma-informed. I think that we are not understanding how trauma um, is lived every day. I, I don't think that we understand trauma from a child or adolescent perspective. I don't think that we understand trauma from an adult perspective. And so it becomes important for our organizations, our schools, our churches, our courts, our judicial system, the children's authority, the police. I think that everybody needs to understand how to become trauma informed and trauma sensitive. So be because the, the reason for that is that if we are not treating trauma from a real place, what we are doing is putting bandage. We have a lot of people putting bandage all over the place. We deal with, with what we see in front of our faces, but we are not dealing with what is causing what we see. Unfortunately for our children and adolescents, 
we see their behavior as difficult, as bad. And so we label them as opposed to understanding where that behavior might be coming from. We see an adult who might be behaving in a particular manner. And what we do, we laugh, we, we, we make fun, we don't understand or we become punitive. And so what I'm saying here is that agency organization need to become trauma informed. It means that the people who work there must understand trauma. The people who work there must understand how to treat and identify trauma. And then we must build a system around our clients. We must build a system around society so that people can understand how to break down trauma, how to live around the trauma without having the trauma direct our path. If we begin to do this, then we will see more and more people are getting the help that they need. If we do this, our agencies are going to be more responsive to trauma. Even in this scenario here, I've listened to the news all day yesterday and today, but this most tragic, and I, I mean, I cannot even imagine the pain that this family is feeling. Um, after this fire and you, you know we're going to provide the counseling and we're going to provide this and you're not understanding right now all we need to do is provide the physiological needs because the people might not be in a place rightly at this time to sit down and have a conversation in therapy and so if you are not trauma informed you are not making the right decision if you do not know how trauma affects the adolescent brain then can you truly help them if you do not know what happened as a child can you help that adult who is dealing with a darkness so you need to put people in these positions in these organizations who understand trauma i'm not saying everybody needs to be trauma specialists but there's something inherently powerful when you start to see a person from a trauma lens, when you start to see what they are going through, when you start to understand their symptomatology, you will understand their prognosis, their progress in terms of how you treat with them. If we tackle this as a nation, and for you, let me hasten to add, it must start from the legislative perspective. So we need to legislate. I keep making the point. We need to remove um, suicide from a criminal offense because we cannot criminalize suicidality. We need to remove that so that we can remove the stigma so that people will feel comforted to come forward. We need to make places, safe spaces available with professionals to treat trauma, to treat mental health. Because you want to begin to do that, then we will see our country moving. I am over the, 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 the what we could do on the ground. I'm talking about as a nation, if we move as a nation, we could see how we can deal with this by putting the people in place, by making safe spaces for people, by changing our legislation to support mental health, by making employers understand the power of mental illness and what it does to a person. Once you begin to do these things for you, we will understand that as a nation, we will be able to treat with the trauma that we are confronted with on a daily basis. But, but Han, but, Trinidad and Tobago, we have a whole lot of trauma. I hear you, but, but Hannah Benjamin, doesn't that require a level of compassion? Whether we're talking about compassion from the decision making as, as far as moving the legislation in the, the legislation in the direction that you would like to see, uh, as far as understanding these issues of trauma and why we need to put legislation in place to facilitate people uh, getting treatment for these issues. And also, you, you just mentioned the situation with employers and, uh, and, and so on. Somebody might say, look, you know, um, me I really want to hear about your personal problems, you know, you just do my work. That is all I'm interested in. And, and not realizing that if you were to maybe even spend five minutes to ask someone, you know, so you, you're looking a little trouble this morning, Are you everything all right? Just, 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 just that reaching out to somebody, which, which shows our, our, our willingness and our concern for somebody beyond whatever value you see in them as an employee or whatever. I don't get the sense that we in Trinidad and Tobago are inclined in that direction. I remember, I mean, for, forgive me for giving so, uh, so, um, examples, but I remember the first time I had to go to court in 1987, not for a matter, but as a reporter. And I saw the way the judge spoke to, to someone who was in the dock. And the, the only thing he called him was a piece of so-and-so, you know? And, 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 I'm, and I told myself at the time, is this how we are supposed to treat one another, even if they are criminals or, or whatever? So I, I say all of that to ask the question, 
are we even in a position as a society to show that level of maybe compassion is too Sophie Sophie a word or that 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 willingness to understand the circumstances of others to even think of going in the way of legislation or, or, or counseling or just hearing what other people are going through. So Jerry, let me break it down this way for you because I, I like to speak it from a place that people will understand. And the people will understand dollars and cents for you. We understand the bottom line money. The hidden cost of mental health on, a, on an economy. And I'm talking about from a business all the way up to government. If we begin to understand it from that perspective, maybe, just maybe, we might move faster on legislation. Maybe employers might be more inclined to understand mental health and the problem. Let me tell you this for you. When I talk about the hidden cost of mental health, how many persons take sick leave every day because they are actually physically sick? Most people take sick leave because they want a mental health day. But of course, we don't have that carded anywhere in our negotiation or in our collective bargaining. So there is something called a mental health day in most organizations. So you say, I take a sick leave and you go down the road and you get a sick leave for three days, four days. But the actuality is when people are frustrated, when people are stressed out, they cannot perform. Productivity is low. When you have to spend six hours a day in traffic to get to our work, and to go back home, you are, your productivity is low. When you have to deal with the stress of family stress, financial stress, you cannot perform. And so if we don't deal with the employee who cannot perform, your bottom line is affected. The productivity of the country is affected. The bottom line of the country is affected. So it will be in everybody's interest if we were to deal with mental health on a national level. Because then if we are able to help that employee, then that employee might become more productive. If that employee becomes productive, then we could see more money flowing through the country. So when you talk about the hidden costs, I want every agency, accounts department, to tally in the last four years, five years, how many man hours was lost due to sick leave. How many money, when I say man hours, in terms of replacement to get the job done, in terms of loss of productivity when the employee doesn't come to work, put a figure to it. And I will guarantee you that figure is in the billions of dollars as a nation we have lost due to mental health issues. And so if we don't deal with this frontally, the hidden cost of mental health will continue to be understood. That is why I'm saying to unions, your role is no longer to go march in the street and beat a drum but to fight for the mental well-being of your members because that is where the bread and butter is going to come. Okay, but, produce. but okay, but uh, having said all of that, which worker is willing to acknowledge that I need, I, I need treatment, I need therapy? Which worker is going? Because even today, in many of those, uh, those professionals who offer these services, therapy and so on, you go through the side door because you don't want anybody to know that you're going by the therapist. Because I agree it's, it's, with it's, you it's, it's something to be ashamed of. But for you, I have seen where workers are willing to come forward. I think what needs to happen is we, we need to remove the stigma that surrounds mental health and we need to make it accessible to so many people. Because of its exclusivity, we find that people have to come to the back door. But if we make mental health accessible to all and sundry in a real way, in a real way, then you will realize that more and more people are going to come forward. People have EAP, but of course, when you look at the utilization rate of EAP, it's less than 2%. As a matter of fact, the international benchmark is 5% because of the stigma that is attached. And then in terms of trying to bago, we like to put people business on Main Street. And that is why I tell you at the center here, one of our greatest pillars is that of confidentiality. And so when, if people feel as if you're going to talk my business, everybody in HR will know, good, and if you want for therapy, he and your man having problems, then of course I wouldn't come forward. So we need to remove the stigma around mental health. I believe that people are reaching out more and more and more. And I think COVID-19 has pushed us even further along that line. But we need to create a system where mental health is readily available. We need to remove the stigma. Even from the religious sector, we need to remove the stigma, right? Around that person so that a person will feel comforted to come forward and say, I need help. And when people come to see help, 
you know, we, we like to see the bandage around your neck or the cast on your hand. No mental illness, we can't see it, but we could live it, we could feel it. Once we start to understand that from a real perspective, we're going to see a healed society. But right now, as you rightly say, a lot of us are going through the back door because we don't want nobody to know we're going for therapy. But let us create a system where people can feel comforted to come forward and seek help. And in the same way that I asked you earlier that, uh, as to whether we are making strides and you said yes as far as the level of awareness and the public discourses, are you seeing that? Are you, are you seeing a, 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 a reduction in, in that, that level of stigma that, that people actually feel comfortable in saying, well, look, you know, I, I, I'm seeking counseling because I suffer with anxieties, I suffer with depression, uh, but not just because of COVID-19, and that I, I'm getting counseling for this because I need help and I have no, 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 no shame in telling anybody about it because there's nothing to be ashamed of. Is that discourse taking place at all? It is taking place, for sure, and I'm, that is why I'm so excited because more and more I see families are coming forward. I see individuals, I see men, men, and that is, that, that is a, a, a very difficult conversation for a lot of men. When I get a telephone call from a man and saying, yo, I want to come in and talk to you, I have some problems, you understand? I, I am happy about that. When I look at platforms, I am seeing more and more people are talking, they are sharing their own experiences about treatment, about getting help. And I tell people, a therapy is not because you have a mental illness. Therapy is because you're just going through stress and you want somebody to talk to. Sometimes for you one session and somebody say, ah, oh boy, I got to go. I just needed to unravel this confusion in my head. You, you understand? And, and, and that is enough. So therapy is not just about you're, you're mad or, 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 or you're, you're mentally ill. No, therapy is about you going through a stressful event or you going through something that requires a process of uh, 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 with somebody else who is a neutral outsider to really walk you through this. And that is the power of, of, of what therapy is. And so we need to really remove that mental health stigma that is the madman on the street. That is the that, no, we need to remove that because you see, there is a difference between mental illness and mental health. Mental health is how we help ourselves to remain not nice, to help ourselves think properly, to help ourselves cope with the challenges from a positive perspective. Mental illness is the furthest end of the spectrum when we leave those challenges unchecked. And just like physical health, you go to the doctor to receive help. If for mental challenges or for stress up, once you come, you can receive help. These things are in fact treatable. The problem is we live with it. We allow it to fester and then it starts to manifest itself in negative ways throughout our lives. So we start to become bitter and angry and all of these type of things. And so those are the criticalities that we need to deal with in relation to how we are treating with the trauma. And a, and a final perspective, because we have just about a, a minute and a half left, hand is Pandit Benjamin, and we always uh, thank you for taking the time to have this discussion uh, with us. Uh, what, what, what is your final perspective that you'd like to leave with us? Because invariably, when a tragedy happens, we have this discussion. When the next one happens, we'll call you again to get a perspective. What, what would give you hope that we are moving in the right direction in the minute that we have left? I think even the response to, what, to, to my training that I have coming up today, the response tells me that agencies are interested in becoming trauma-informed. It tells me that the professionals are interested in being trained and developed in terms of understanding the trauma. And these conversations are important because there are people who may never be able to get a professional, but they can hear us and this discourse and get a tip or two. It is important as a nation to respond to trauma from the legislation all the way down to practice. It is important that we understand trauma in children, adolescents, and adults. It is important for us to treat trauma, to treat mental health as a real thing. Once we begin to do those things, once we become trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive, then we are on the right track. Let us put mental health as a priority. Let us put mental health as equal on physical health. Let's create safe spaces so that these families who are impacted by this trauma can come in and get the help that they need for you. 
Hannah Benjamin, thank, thank you. you very much indeed for taking the time to be with us uh, this morning and indeed offering uh, your expert perspective in that regard for an issue that is invisible for, for many people but is very, very real uh, when you talk about uh, the emotional challenges that many of us face in Trinidad and Tobago, whether they are triggered by traumatic events like yesterday or indeed have been ongoing for quite some time. Well, uh, as we go to the break, here's an early morning reflection captured on the western side of the San Fernando Yacht Club and that's some really beautiful colours uh, presented to us by that image and now a golden beehive, golden beehive lilies, not beehive, these are lilies, golden beehive lilies submitted by Ken Mahias. Two very interesting images presented to us uh, by our viewers as we go to the top of the hour.